Y'all ready? Let's do it. Okay. Oh. So why do I, 19 male, get so triggered by people having a different opinion from me, and how do I fix it? At 14 years old, my dad left the family. I was raised by him to be one of those men who doesn't show any emotions, and I got pretty good at it. I don't know when, but at some point that year, I decided this sucked and started training myself to show more emotions. I was homeschooled up until 18, so I was very sheltered and pretty much got anything social from my family, their close friends, or the internet. During that time, I was very active on Twitter, joined a ton of fandoms, and was around people who believed in the same stuff and enjoyed the same things I did. One toxic thing about social media is everyone, quote, retweets stuff they disagree with and spreads it. Eventually, I started muting nearly every word that could possibly show me any, anything like racism, LGBT phobia, Islamophobia. Eventually, I started to mute stuff I like so I didn't have to see other people's opinions on it because anything bad would lead to a panic attack. I also had 30K blocked users. I decided to leave Twitter in 2021 because I didn't want to deal with a panic attack or with a panic attack every week. Fast forward to 2022 and I'm a mess. While I've successfully interacted with other people and don't suffer from social anxiety to my surprise, I still suffer from the same problem. Anyone who has a different opinion from me call or calls something I like bad can risk making me feel 24 times worse. While I no longer suffer from panic attacks for the opinion reason, and while IRL is, is not as bad as it was online, it's still a problem I deal with. Sometimes I get huge urges to look up triggering content or scroll through a sub that is the opposite of what I love or look up bad reviews for shows I like, and I have no idea what the motive is. Sometimes I do it and make my mental health worse. I know I'm the problem here, and I'm not going to change everyone's mindset, nor do I want to, but I would like advice on dealing with this. Great post. So today, a chat, what I'd like to talk to you all about is, generally speaking, the concept of like ego identity and like how to grow in a positive way with respect to these things. These are things that we've seen a lot of interest about in the last couple of months, even, I guess, years, like since the beginning of our community. But I think that as people sort of start to learn some of the basics about ego and identity, what we've sort of discovered is that there's more and more interest for learning like more about this stuff. So what I'd like to do today is kind of walk you all through um, how can we understand this situation. And the key things that I'm going to point out are so this is a person who gets very upset when people have differing opinions from them, right? So there's like, there's going to be some issues here that we're going to kind of dig into, okay? So let's go ahead and, and take a look at those. So the first is, I want you all to kind of, so we're going to be talking today about the ego or the Sanskrit ahamkar. And I like the Sanskrit definitions because remember that the Eastern perspective of the mind was developed through introspection. So these are yogis that are sitting, you know, in a cave in the mountains, just with their eyes closed and observing their mind. Whereas the Western perspective of the mind is developed more objectively and externally. So like if we think about, you know, major contributors to the Western models of the mind, they're people who made scientific observations. The key thing about scientific observations is that they're from the outside, right? So Sigmund Freud would listen to people speak. And using their words would approximate a model of the mind based on people's words. Now, the downside of this, I think, is very simple. There's upsides and downsides. The downside is that just think a little bit about the gap between your words and the functions of your mind, right? There's a pretty big gap there. Generally speaking, as we become trained listeners and things like that, we can try to shrink that gap. As people become more authentic, we can try to shrink that gap. But ultimately, I don't know how good words are It is tools to understand internal processes. The upside of the Western method is that it's objective, right? So if I'm studying my own mind, I'm going to be subject to cognitive biases. Whereas in the objective model, like especially if you look at like cognitive behavioral therapy or like the work of Aaron Beck, these are people or the behaviorists, right? They made like lots of observations. And so you can use the benefit of science use the benefit of lots of subjects to come to a more objective answer. The reason that I'm going to talk about sort of the Eastern perspective today is because I find that the Eastern perspective is more relatable as an individual. So for example, if I say this is the Oedipal complex, and I can explain intellectually the Oedipal complex, 
And people can even say, oh yeah, like that on some level describes my experience. The challenge is that your experience of your mind from moment to moment is is less likely to map on very easily to the edible complex. It requires like a lot of work to bridge that gap. Whereas the Eastern perspective of the mind, the reason I like it is because it seems very accessible to people. Like this is a model of the mind that I've taught to like 10 year olds and they sort of get it, okay? So let's, let's just talk a little bit about the ego or the humkar. So the first thing that I, I wanna point out is that generally speaking, when we, we have kind of toxic or negative influences, there are two ways that we can deal with them, okay? One is externally. So in this case, this person is blocking people, right? And this sort of makes sense, like we can limit our environment. So one way is to externally deal with the stimuli, right? So what we wanna do is kind of like, we wanna limit what enters our senses or indriyas. So the ego or the hamkar is the sense of identity. We're gonna take sort of an Eastern perspective. And if we look at that post, we remember that there are toxic or negative influences. And the way that this person is dealing with those toxic or negative influences is largely through external sources. So they're blocking people on Twitter. And the yogis sort of understood this as well. This is why people will go to monasteries or ashrams for, you know, like spiritual study, for example. This is why we like go to school, right? So we tend to control our external environment to facilitate a certain kind of action within the mind. So changing our environment can be very, very important. But there's another aspect here which can be internal, right? So if we think about like, I don't know that you block 30,000 people on Twitter, but think a little bit about, you know, anytime something external happens that's disruptive, anytime something is offensive to your sense organs or triggers some kind of negative emotion, the solution isn't necessarily to just block it, right? So there's some amount of like internal dealing with negative things. And that's what I'm gonna call resilience. And so what tends to happen, if we kind of think about, you know, why do I call that resilience? It's like, what do we think of as resilience? Resilience is the ability to like tolerate and withstand like negative things, right? So someone who's resilient can deal with some amount of like punishment or toxicity or whatever. So what we're going to explore today is sort of this, this aspect here. And because it seems like this person has done a really good job of sort of externally controlling their environment. So what, what I want to kind of point out is that resilience is the way that we sort of tolerate what I'm going to call discordance. So if I believe thing A and someone believes thing B, resilience is sort of the ability to like tolerate this gap, right? So this is what resilience is. So if, if I think that I'm, you know, a good person and someone is calling me a bad person, my ability to tolerate them saying that has something to do with my degree of resilience, right? So if my teacher says, oh, you're terrible at math, but deep down I know I'm good at math, like I'm resilient. I'm not going to let that affect me or I won't let it affect me very much. So this kind of internal, th this discordance between you and the outside world is like what I sort of think of as resilience. The other thing that we can talk about this, uh, we, the other word that we can use here is confidence. And this is going to become important, especially as we start talking about ego, right? So if we think about someone who's confident, they can tolerate discordant opinions. So if I'm confident in my, let's say, atheistic beliefs, and there's someone I'm talking to who has very re religious beliefs, I can sort of acknowledge that like, yeah, I don't think you're correct. Like, I believe what I believe. You believe what you believe. Like, that's totally fine. I happen to think that you're wrong and that I'm correct. But like, I'm not gonna get bent out of shape over it, right? It's not gonna affect me like emotionally or powerfully. It's not gonna send me into a panic attack. You can easily reverse the scenario, right? You can say as someone who's religious, there's someone who's atheistic, you may disagree with them and that's totally fine. We're not saying one person is right or one person is wrong. What I'm talking about is internally, how confident you are and how resilient you are determines how much you can tolerate differing opinions or discordance between you and the outside world. So the other thing to understand is that the ego needs concordance, right? So we say that the confidence doesn't necessarily need concordance. You can tolerate people disagreeing. Another simple example is like, let's say you decide to break up with someone or someone decides to break up with you. And it's kind of like an amicable breakup because both of y'all decide, okay, this is like not the right relationship, nothing against you personally. It doesn't mean I'm a bad person or you're a bad person. It's just not walk working out. So if you have two confident people in a relationship who sort of mutually kind of decide, like, 
this is not the right fit. Like they can walk away from that without getting emotional about it, without getting, I mean, there may be some emotions, which is totally fine, but not getting like their egos attacked, right? Oh, like, why are you doing this to me? Oh my God, I'm so pathetic. I'm sorry I failed you. Oh my God, you're so pathetic. Like, why can't you be better? So though, that's like the action of ego, right? The confidence is like different from that. There's a whole video about confidence versus ego in Dr. K's guide. And I'm almost half assuming that people have sort of watched that. But if you are more interested in that, we go into more detail, but we'll kind of continue going now. So the ego needs concordance. Another good example of this is like if we think about someone who's egotistical, like they need praise, right? Because the thing about ego is that if we say that confidence and ego are at the opposite ends of a spectrum, right? And you can either move this way or this way. We can think about the egotistical person as someone who like needs reassurance from the outside world. That's why they're egotistical. That's why they'll, they'll advertise their successes, right? These are people who will be very, very vocal about their successes. They'll be vocal about how much money they make. They'll be vocal about the car they drive. They'll be vocal about how they're better than other people. They'll be really, really vocal. And why is that? It's because since you don't believe it about yourself, you have to convince other people, right? So you want something to be true. And like the more that you can convince other people, the better off you will feel about yourself because internally you don't really feel it yourself. So the ego, unlike the confidence or the lack of the ahamkar, needs concordance, right? And what resilience is, is the capacity to tolerate discordance. And when we are not resilient or we sort of don't have that confidence within ourselves, sometimes the most effective solution we come up with is to block people is to limit our external surroundings, right? I just can't tolerate this kind of thing because it makes me feel bad. I'm not quite sure why or how, but like, so I'm gonna shut it off, which is okay. Like you can do that, right? That's like a healthy part of it. Like we said earlier, monks engage in this stuff, students engage in this stuff, it's not bad. It's just important to understand what your options are and actually use both of them. So the next thing to understand um, about kind of ego is that like, let's kind of go back to, um, let, let's actually take a quick tangent and talk about attachment theory for a second. So I know that this is sort of an Eastern perspective, but if y'all are interested in sort of the science behind some of this stuff, we can talk about attachment theory for a second. So how do we develop confidence, right? So this is the main question. It, okay, Dr. K, you're saying that confidence is, is good, ego is bad, so like how do we develop confidence? And this is where thankfully like scientific research, right? So this is Western psychology. Um, you know, the, there, there are a lot of excellent uh, uh, researchers who sort of developed this idea called attachment theory. And attachment theory essentially is like, in my opinion, or I don't know if it's the best, but it's the scientific explanation for confidence that I personally like the most. So some people go through life and are confident. Other people go through life and are not confident, right? This is like a general state of their being. And sure, confidence can vary in terms of whether we're talking about lost ark or plumbing, Right. But like generally speaking, some people are more outgoing, more confident. Some people are more concerned that the world is a dangerous place. And a simplistic way to kind of dig into that attachment theory is very, very vast and deep and complex. I'm going to try to over some uh, oversimplify here for a second. But what the researchers in attachment theory essentially discovered is that when we are emotionally mirrored early in childhood, we develop confidence. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about what this means. So early on, when we're like one year old or two years old or three years old, what happens is like we don't understand the world, right? Like the world doesn't make sense, it's entirely new. So the way that we develop confidence, what people noticed is that when children are around adults that emotionally mirror them, those are the children that become confident. So when I like fall, trip and fall and I hurt myself, I am feeling pain, right? I don't know exactly what that is because I'm a one-year-old. Like I don't understand the philosophy of pain. All I know is that it hurts. I'm not, I'm kind of confused. Like I'm a kid. I don't understand stimuli yet, right? All I know is in a vague sense, it hurts. So then when people around me respond, right? So when my parents come and pick me up and they're like, oh, poor baby. And this is also interesting because it's conserved between cultures, but Generally speaking, parental figures and other adults will have exaggerated emotional responses with children. So it's like if the child walks up to you and like shows you like, look, I have a pen. Like, do we, are we like, oh, 
whatever, dude, why, why are you showing me that? That's not how adults respond, right? Well, how adults respond is like, oh my God, that's a white pen. Where did you find the white pen? So we have this exaggerated emotional response. Oh my God, did baby get hurt? Oh my poor thing, let me pick you up, let me hold you. Oh my poor darling, my poor precious, my child. Oh my God, are you okay? So we have these exaggerated emotional responses, right? So, and why is that? And that's because like actually what happens is when we have an exaggerated emotional response, it actually demonstrates to the child what they're feeling. So children will learn, oh, okay, like I'm feeling sad and they'll see your facial expression and they'll, they'll see like, okay, that's sadness or that's support or like, so, that, so what happens is in the world, there's concordance between what the child experiences and how adults respond to them. And essentially what happens is when kids sort of have a lot of concordance between their internal experience and the rest of the world, then the world makes sense. There are rules to the game, right? So think about it this way. If I'm a kid and I get hurt and then like instead of being supported, if my parents start yelling at me for crying, like what do I learn about the world? I learn that the world is like a confusing place, right? Where like if I get hurt, like I should be punished for getting hurt. That's the sort of lessons people take away. And so if the world is like confusing, and so what the attachment theory researchers um, sort of discovered is that when there's like variable emotional responses based on uh, from caregivers. So a good example of this is like alcoholics. So I have an alcoholic parent while they're sober, like they're going to be loving and caring. But while they're drunk, they're going to be like angry and yell at me and stuff like that. So then what happens is like I determine that the world is a confusing place where I don't know the rules. And if I don't know the rules, how can I move about the world with confidence? Right? So if you think about like how do kids get confidence because they like learn how stuff works. Like how does a child develop confidence with walking? It's because like walking is the same every single time. Now imagine like trying to learn how to walk if like every other day or for a few hours a day when your parents are drunk, suddenly like gravity turns off, right? Like it would be so much harder to work. The rules of the game have changed. And once you don't understand the rules of the game, like it's hard to move about confidently in the world, Okay. So this is kind of a quick aside to attachment theory, but the key thing is that concordance or emotional mirroring instills confidence, okay? So even if we bounce to the post for a second, right? This is where like, remember, like when we were looking at the post, what we sort of saw was that, okay, dad left the family, Raised doesn't show any emotions and I got pretty good at it, right? Homeschooled as well. So what we're sort of noticing is that like we're not really 100% sure, right? So we could ask more questions to this person about their upbringing. But they definitely appear to have some kind of setup that suggests like suboptimal emotional mirroring, right? Including an emotionally unavailable father who then after the age of 14 like left. So that's like kind of, it's unfortunate, right? But this is what happened. This is the truth of the world is that sometimes that's how we grow up. So this is kind of a quick aside that sort of demonstrates that concordance and emotional mirroring instill confidence, okay? So now let's go back to this person's main question, which is like, why can't I tolerate disagreement? Right? That's kind of the core question here. And so generally speaking, I think the main reason for this is a lack of faith in yourself, right? This kind of goes back to the ego point, but if I, um, if I am, uh, you know, if I'm confident in myself, like I can tolerate people disagreeing with me. If I'm egotistical, like if I'm insecure about my appearance, I need lots and lots of compliments about my appearance, right? Whereas if I'm very secure in my appearance, like people could even be insulting and like I would generally speaking be okay with that, right? I mean, I'm not saying that you're impervious to it. So every time you get an insulting comment, like it's going to chip away at your confidence a little bit generally. But, you know, you, your resilience, your capacity to tolerate negativity is going to be high if you're confident in yourself. And if you can't tolerate discordance with the outside world, it generally comes down to like I think a lack of faith in yourself. And so this is where once you have a lack of faith in yourself or if you haven't developed this kind of attachment theory, emotional mirroring, confidence kind of stuff, you don't really know like 
who you are, you don't really understand that deep down you're a good person, then what tends to happen, like, so when we don't have an understanding of who we truly are, when this is a question mark, when we don't understand who we truly are, we tend to feel, this is the key part about ahamkar, okay? When we don't understand who we truly are, when we lack confidence in ourselves, what we tend to do is fill in the gap with external things. Right? So this is going to be kind of a random aside. We'll go into this more, more detail later. But remember, in the yogic concept, we have a true self. There's a really easy version, a way to understand your true self. Just close your eyes for like five minutes and just experience whatever you experience. And this is where like, it's kind of weird, but like what you're going to discover is it's like relatively neutral, right? There's not going to be like much gender to your experience. I mean, maybe you're, you know, you do have some physical sensations that denote some kind of gender, but generally speaking throughout your day, like, you know, the color of your skin is going to be irrelevant in terms of your experience. People may react to you differently, but if I'm like sitting outside in the sun, like, you know, my ethnicity doesn't really matter that much. Sure. There may be like some element of sunburn depending on, you know, how much uh, melanin my skin cells have and things like that. But generally speaking, like, you know, the color of my skin or the color of my hair or things like that won't matter in terms of like everyday experiences, right? So if I, if I take a sip of tea, like the experience of tasting the tea doesn't matter whether I'm 15, 30 or 45, doesn't matter whether, I, whether I'm a man or woman, it doesn't matter, matter whether I have long hair or short hair. The experience of life is like independent, generally speaking, of identity. Oh, I'm talking about like an actual moment in time, right? And so this is where you can say, but what about things like racism and stuff like that? But yeah, so, but even then, so if, I, if, if I'm attacked by someone due to my race, my experience of that attack is actually independent of race, right? So if someone like, you know, physically attacks me because of the color of my skin, my experience of that moment of physical pain is actually independent of the color of my skin. Is it being caused because of racism? Absolutely. So we're not saying that that's not important. What we're saying is that the actual experience of, let's say, getting you know pushed to the ground is independent of any kind of identity. It sucks for all people, right? So this is what the yogis sort of discovered, is that there's this true self, which is actually described by neti neti. And what neti neti means is a Sanskrit phrase for not this, not this. So any attribute that you can define yourself with is not actually the true self. So, and then we have the false self, and this is the ahamkar. This is the ego. And this is where we have all kinds of attributes, right? So I was valedictorian. Top of my class. Or I'm a failure. Whereas like at the end of the day, you know, anyone, if you're just sitting in the sun or you're taking a bath, like whether you're a failure or a success, whether you're a billionaire or a pauper, like it sort of doesn't matter, right? The experience of water on your skin is stable. So what tends to happen is the less we understand this, and this is also where like confidence brings us closer to the true self. I think that's what it really is, is, is like confidence is like an understanding of our true self. Um, the more we tend to fill in the gap with external things. And so then what happens is we begin to form an identity around beliefs. Okay? So like a good example of this is like, if you don't really know who you are, who you, if you don't know who you are, you substitute who you are with things that you believe. So y'all may know like people who have identities that revolve around like a particular thing like a cause or a political belief or some kind of like moralistic stance. So one of the things that terrifies me is how immoral people who believe in a good cause can be. And a good example of this is like what I would call the angry vegan. So I have nothing against veganism. Veganism is actually like probably very good for the environment. From a biomass perspective, it's fantastic. From a health perspective, it's really good. But sometimes you'll encounter someone who's like an angry vegan, right? And so, like, being a vegan is not just something that they do. It's not like they're just trying to, like, do something good for the environment and, like, it's a choice that I make. I'm cool with it. Like, it'd be awesome if more people were vegan, but, like, you do you. I'm going to do me. That's sort of like a confident vegan. And then we have the angry vegans. And the angry vegans are, like, you know, they're, like, very, very hurt and offended and, and very aggressive. 
And if you try to like engage them in discussion, they're going to actually be like somewhat like toxic and judgmental and things like that. Veganism becomes a whole part of their identity, like who they are is vegan. It's not just a lifestyle choice. It's like a completely transformative way of life. And once again, nothing against vegans. I, you know, I think it's fantastic if you decide to become a vegan, like you do you and like good for you and probably good for the environment and good for your body. So fantastic. The next example of this is people who are very, very political, right? So like where politics is no longer just, you know, a choice. It's like it becomes a core part of our identity. It becomes part of who we are. And so, um, you know, the other thing that we sort of see with these people is once again, once you start to have like, you know, an ahamkar or, uh, you know, ego develop around these core beliefs that these have to be heavily advertised. Right. So most of like the calm, chill, confident vegans are not like super aggressive in advertising on social media. The people who like advertise on social media and are like being very, very, um, you know, aggressive towards people are the ones that have to like advertise like how awesome of a vegan they are and are like very judgmental towards other people. So we can see once again that like the ego, which requires external support, is relates to our sense of identity and that that sort of engages like the more that people go down the egotistical route the more vocal they become like you could vocally advocate for things without being egotistical but that's also where like you can you, you can sort of notice the difference in terms of how they engage other people in discussion right so if if like someone engages you know a confident vegan in discussion like they're not going to make personally slanderous remarks right they're just going to be like yeah you know i disagree with you here are the reasons why so it's kind of like a civilized discussion between an atheist and a religious person or an uncivilized discussion between like diehard religious people and like diehard atheists, right? So those are very different things. And so, you know, what we end up seeing with the ego is since you doubt, you have to demonstrate. Because you don't really know who you are. You're not really confident in yourself. And with the absence of those things, if you don't, if you don't know you yourself are a good person, you have to work really, really hard to convince everyone else that you're a good person. And the way that you do that is by demonstrating very, very loudly, right? Because the more people you can convince that you are a good person, the more your insecurity will like feel kind of calmed down because, you know, like, oh, if like a thousand people think I'm a good person, then I must be a good person. Because deep down uh, within your own mind, you're not sure you're not truly confident, right? So insecurity will sometimes manifest in this way with trying to be like aggressive with other people and like convincing people of things. So let's kind of go back to this person's situation, okay? So let's try to recap for a moment. So this is someone who gets triggered by the opinions of others. Okay? And what we kind of notice is that like anyone who has a different opinion from me or calls something I like bad can risk making me feel 24 times worse. So that's kind of really interesting, right? So when people disagree, I feel bad, which is kind of weird, right? So I want y'all to just think about that for a second. How does a disagreement become a judgment or personally emotional experience, right? Like, it's kind of strange, right? So like, it's like, it's kind of like, I like pepperoni pizza and someone else is like, I like pineapple pizza. And then like, I feel bad, like that's weird, right? So we can say like, depending on which camp you're in, you know, you are an uncivilized barbarian for liking that, how dare you? But if we really kind of stop and think about it, there's something weird going on here. Like, why does someone feel personally bad based on an external disagreement or opinion that someone like another human being holds? And this is the kind of thing where like, this is where ego comes in, right? So this is like where I would act, like, this is where I, I would ask, you know, one question. So if you're in this kind of situation where you get personally like feel bad or feel attacked or need everyone around you to kind of agree with what you say, and the key question to ask yourself is if someone disagrees, what does that say about me? Right? Because this is the key. Y'all see this? Like, 
The key thing is that an external disagreement, which can be purely intellectual and totally fine, is somehow getting translated into a personal judgment or somehow getting translated into some sense of identity, right? And so for the people who say, what does that say about me? It says nothing about me. These are the people that are confident. But if you really pay attention, the people who have a humkars, have egos, don't really understand who they are, you know, haven't been emotionally mirrored early on in life, haven't really discovered the true nature of self, they're going to be the ones that are like, uh, it says something about me, right? It says that I am wrong. Like, it's kind of bizarre, but like, you can sort of get the sense from this person's post that, you know, sometimes I, I get huge urges to look up triggering content or scroll through a sub that is the opposite of what I love or look up bad reviews for shows I like and I have no idea what the motive is, right? Sometimes like I do it and make my mental health worse. It's because what you, we'll get, kind of get to that in a second, but what we're sort of noticing is that there's like a, a huge internal component to this experience. It's about like being perceived in a particular way. And like, if I can find other people to confirm, if, if I, I look up the negative reviews, then it confirms what I believe about myself, which is that like, you know, I'm not, my opinions aren't good or worthwhile. And the other place that you'll see this is after a breakup. If you're feeling really, really bad about yourself, right? What your mind will do is go and seek out stimuli to confirm what it believes about you. So if you're feeling terrible about yourself, what you're going to do is go look at pictures of your ex and then you're going to see, like, if you see a single picture of your ex with someone else, right? You don't know if they're boyfriend, girlfriend. You don't know if it's, like, platonic. You're going to look at all of those pictures. And each of those pictures is going to be a punch to your gut. And you just can't help yourself. Because what your mind is looking for is concordance. Right? That's what the mind craves. The mind wants to make sense of the world. Because now I can navigate it. And if I feel a particular way about myself and I go seek out confirmatory stimuli, then, oh, okay, like at least I make sense, right? Because what the mind hates more than anything else is confusion. Even if I am a bad person, at least I can navigate my life as a bad person as long as I know I'm a bad person. So the mind values concordance over goodness, right? It, it, it wants certainty over positivity. That's really what it wants. It's more important for your, your mind to be consistent than it is for it to be correct. So there are a couple of other questions that you can ask yourself, which is like, how do I feel about myself? Right? And the last question is, am I a good person? So this is a yes or no question. So as you start to ask the, some of these questions, what you'll notice is like you're starting to understand, okay, where am I on this axis of like true self versus false self, right? Am I confident? Do I really know who I am? Because a lot of times when I have conversations with people who are sort of in this kind of scenario, I'm making a lot of assumptions here. But like, you know, I, I, if this was someone that I was interviewing on stream, I'd ask them like, do you, how do you feel about yourself? Do you think you're a good person? And, and like the answers that I usually get are like, I have no idea, like how the how the hell are you supposed to even know whether you're a good person? Like, what does that even mean? Right? It's so foreign. It's like, I guess, and sometimes what they'll say is like external things. Well, like people tell me I'm a good person, right? Like they'll, or like they'll say like, I'm not entirely sure. Like, I don't know. Like, you know, so there's just a lot of confusion here where people don't really understand who they are. In the absence of understanding who you are, you fill it in with ego, right? You fill it in with external things because your mind needs some way to navigate the world. And if it doesn't have a good understanding of who you are internally, it's going to pick stuff from the outside and fill in that vacuum. So the next uh, kind of question to ask is like, okay, so if, if you're in this situation, what do, Dr. K? So the first thing that I want to acknowledge is that if you're actually having panic attacks, right, that's absolutely a reason to go see a licensed mental health professional. Like, because I, I know it sounds like you figured out the source of your panic attacks is, you know, through limiting Twitter. But if this is a tried and true panic attack, like, you know, you may want to get that checked out, right? So if you're experiencing impairments or you're concerned about possible impairments, then you should absolutely go see a licensed professional. Okay? So you may want to, you know, see a therapist. And if you're like, is it a true panic attack or not a true pa panic attack? I don't know. And that's all like, like, you're not supposed to know, right? That's the job of a therapist. 
So one of the things that, you know, clinicians do is like they have to evaluate you. So a, another thing that I see is that a lot of people think like, okay, how do I know if I need help? Like, how do I know if it's bad enough to need treatment? Whereas that's the wrong question because you're not the one who's going to make that evaluation, right? It's actually like half the job of a clinician is diagnosis. So if you're concerned at all or you're like, it's a question mark for you, then you should absolutely go see someone. Next thing to think a little bit about, just a reminder, right, is we talked about attachment theory. And even if you don't have a, um, even if you don't have a panic disorder, right, which it's, it's important for the therapist to sort of figure out or the clinician to figure out. There's also like other things going on here, like attachment theory, which like attachment theory is what most therapists are trained in. Like basically, at least in the U.S., as far as I know, like everyone learns some attachment theory because it's so central, right? So if you go see like a child and adolescent psychiatrist, for example, they're more likely to have advanced training in attachment theory and things like that. But there's like a lot of benefit from, you know, working with someone who really understands attachment theory. And then the next thing is that, unfortunately, <laughs> there's no substitute That's terrible handwriting. For a good relationship. So even if we sort of think a little bit about what's going on for people in this situation, like this person is looking for external concordance, right? So it's almost like as a kid, we need concordance. This is how we get emotional mirroring. and develop confidence. And then as an adult, if we didn't have this, right, that's still what we're looking for, right? So now we understand like, okay, why we're blocking people on Twitter. I need concordance, right? You're still looking for someone to like help you understand and like meet you where you're at. So we start to shape our external environment looking for concordance. In the worst cases, sometimes what we'll do is enter like you know, echo chamber communities where like, since we don't have the confidence in our beliefs to tolerate discussion and differing opinions, what we'll do is just join people who like believe what we believe, right? Because then we're getting that em emotional, uh, that concordance. We're getting sort of emotional mirroring from these other people. Like if I believe, you know, that COVID-19 is a, a, is a hoax or a conspiracy or something like that, which I don't, right? So COVID is not a hoax. Please get vaccinated. But if I believe that sort of thing and like I feel attacked and hurt and bad when people disagree with me, then what I'm going to do is gravitate towards like people who believe the same things I do. And then through finding that emotional mirroring and that concordance, it sort of assuages some of this like internal lack of confidence kind of stuff. So in a weird way, like even as adults, we're trying to do what we didn't get to do in children. And this is where if you look at broadly, like, you know, theories of child development, what tends to happen is like some people get stuck, right? So you're supposed to do this at one year. You're supposed to do this at two years, five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 and 25. And sometimes you'll meet someone who's like developmentally 15, <clears throat> even though they're 25 years old. And that's not really their fault. It's just like they haven't learned how to do that thing yet, right? So sometimes you'll, you'll meet adults who throw temper tantrums like a five-year-old. And like, why do they do that? It's because they never learned like how to, you know, grow past that point. So sometimes you'll have people who are developmentally like behind where they should be. And this is not, it's not like just they're globally developmentally behind. I mean, there is a diagnosis for that called global developmental delay. But generally speaking, most human beings, like none of us are, you know, exactly at 20. Some of us will be like developmentally advanced and be like at 25 and be precocious in some ways. We'll be like a little bit developmentally, like a little bit stunted. Right. Like so like intellectually, math wise, like I'm a 20 year old who's like my reading level is like at a, at a 25 year old's level. Like emotionally, I'm kind of like at a 15 year old. Right. It was no, totally normal. So, you know, unfortunately, the truth is that, you know, if you if what you were missing early in life is a good relationship, like sometimes there's just no good substitute for a good relationship. And I've sort of seen this a lot where if you look at people who have had like on un, un like very toxic upbringings and stuff like that, strong emotional support from either friends or like aunts or uncles or even a romantic relationship can, can really help those people like learn how to be like emotionally normal, right? Sort of catch up emotionally. So it's kind of unfortunate, but you know, if you really want to talk about on the grand scope of things, what can you do about it? Like I think forming healthy relationships 
is a huge part of like how you get out of this, right? Because when you, when and let, let's kind of tunnel down into why is this? So in a healthy relationship, you're going to have disagreements. You're going to make mistakes. And it is so healing. It is so much positivity and XP in terms of emotional development. When you make a mistake and someone says, you made a mistake, I'm acknowledging the mistake, but you're still a good person. Huge, huge, right? When someone says, yeah, you kind of screwed up and I still like you and I still care for you and you're still a good person and I forgive you. Because what happens until you have that is that your sense of value is determined by mistakes or successes. Right? And this is the, the there's a, a, a video in Dr. K's guide called Conditional Love, which is like when the love that you were shown is like dependent on the value as a human being that you were, the way people demonstrated value or your value as a human being was determined by like whether you made mistakes or you were successful. Very, very common. And so then once, you, once your value is not determined by something intrinsic or the true self, but is determined by performance, then you're going to be squarely grounded in, in the false self. You're going to have a big ego and you're going to lack confidence, right? And then you're going to need to prove how smart you are to everyone all the time, how successful you are to everyone all the time. Last thing that I'd recommend is meditation. So there are some meditations about sort of discovering this true self, right? So like, let me just think about how to share kind of a simple meditative practice. So like, like this is a practice we haven't done in a while. So we'll just demonstrate it. So what I encourage you to do is, is, you know, go grab a drink or, you know, if you have one in front of you, just like pick it up. So we're going to do something called a tea drinking exercise. Okay. So you can do this with any piece of food or beverage or whatever. And so what we're going to do in this practice, it's super simple is like, we're going to just notice who is the person like doing the drinking, right? So think about like who you are. If someone were to ask you, like, who are you? What would you answer? Would you you'd probably say something about your profession or your gender or your ethnicity or your name, right? So we can even just pick something as simple as a name. And as we take a sip of tea, we're just going to ask ourselves, like, who is doing the drinking? Like, like, is this person, the name that you describe yourself as, like, is that the person doing the drinking? And in a sense, like, sort of, yeah, obviously, right? Because I'm me. But then what I want you to imagine for a moment is imagine that an alien being could observe your consciousness or could implant your, your body and experience exactly what you experience for just 60 seconds of sipping tea. How would they determine your name from this experience? How would they figure out? Because if this is truly who you are and that's a part of this experience, then an external observer should be able to find your name through drinking tea, right? And so like now we're going to try. So just kind of think a little bit, uh, just observe who is the person who's drinking the tea? Right, so notice the flavor, the temperature, even the scent. The feeling of it as it goes down into your throat, the aftertaste. And now ask yourself, like, who is doing this drinking? Is this a man or a woman? How would you know if this was all you experienced in life? How would you know that this is a man or a woman or someone who's non-binary? Right? For, for your ethnicity, how would you know that this person is of a particular ethnicity? Right? And as you tunnel down into the experience, you'll start to realize that all of these attributes, whether you're rich or you're poor, or you're, you have a level 39 character in Lost Ark or a level 15 character in Lost Ark, whether you're a man or a woman, all of these attributes, whether you're a father or a son, none of those are actually relevant in this moment. Right? 
Because in that experience of that moment, like that's all the external world. It has nothing to do with the internal experience. And then the question kind of becomes, well, then like, where do we get these identities? Well, we get them from the outside world. And then what the yogis essentially did is they sort of noticed, oh, that's kind of interesting because when I'm drinking tea, I'm a no one. I'm neti neti. And then they were like, well, what happens the moment after I drink tea? Even now as I'm speaking to you, right, as you're listening to this, are you a man or a woman? Neither. Are you rich or are you, are you poor? Neither. If this is all you have, this is the only experience of life you have, is this one slice of consciousness, none of those things are relevant. And then what the yogi sort of figured out, and this is the really hard part, so you can do this if you want to, it's challenging, okay? is that what is life? Life is a collection of moments. That's all it is. So I'm neti neti here. I'm neti neti here. I'm neti neti here. I'm neti neti here. And then the experience of life is neti neti. That's it. Right? It cannot be described. It cannot, like, if you just think about the experience of tea. Like, we can use words to describe it, but I can, I can use as many words as I want to, but there's no way that you're going to understand the experience of tea until you try it yourself, right? And so if you're stuck in this kind of situation of, like, being very, very concerned about disagreeing with other people, feeling bad as a person when other people disagree with you, you can absolutely start by, you know, externally limiting stuff, which is very healthy. Don't get me wrong, right? So limiting toxicity in your life is really good. If Twitter is sending you into panic attacks, stay the hell off of Twitter. But the next thing to understand is that remember that we can try to limit our external environment, but there's an internal component as well. And generally speaking, if you want to live a healthy life, like you should limit this external stuff and you should become resilient. What do I mean by resilience? It's the ability to tolerate discordance, right? And generally speaking, resilience comes from confidence. Where does confidence come from? Well, in attachment theory, it comes from emotional mirroring. In, in the yogic perspective, it comes from a lack of ego. That ego and confidence are at two ends of the spectrum. So as we sort of start to think a little bit about, okay, what is the ego? What is the ahamkar? It's all of the attributes about your life that are not truly you. So it's anything that you can put on a resume. And that the, more, the less we understand who we are, the more we fill up our identity with the attributes from the resume, because we got to put something in there, right? And this is how you end up with people who are like very, very pro-moral cause, right? These are like crusaders. So they're like on a crusade for goodness. And they're like just leaving a wreckage in their wake, right? These are people that are, are you know, campaigning for something that they very strongly believe in. And if you like talk to them, they're like assholes. Like as human beings, they're just assholes. But it's okay for them because they're doing something externally that's good for the world, right? And so if you're kind of getting triggered by the opinion of others, when, when you sort of, when you, when people disagree with you, if you start to feel bad, notice that that's like, that's an ego component, right? Like you're injecting your identity or your sense of self-worth into a disagreement with another human being, which is like humans are allowed to disagree. Pineapple and pizza, yay, nay. Like that has, it says nothing about you as a person, right? But... <laughs> Don't we love to think the opposite? And lastly, when we think a little bit about what to do about it. So the first is that if you're actually having like panic attacks or you're concerned that there's something could be going on that's impairing your function, strongly recommend you go see a therapist. Second thing to understand, and I know that this isn't in everyone's control, but at the end of the day, if you like didn't grow up with a strong father figure who like taught you these sorts of things, that like substituting that, replacing that relationship in some way or replacing with other kinds of relationships are really good. Like that, that, it's just, you can't ignore that as a solution. We're not saying it's in your control. We're not saying it's easy, but I would be remiss to say that like, if you've had bad relationships in the past, one way to fix yourself as a person is to have good relationships. Like that's a huge part of it, right? Someone who understands that you can make mistakes and still says they value you as a person. And the last thing is that you can do spiritual stuff, right? There's actually way more that you can do, but today, you know, I'm going to talk about meditation because this is where, this is the systematic process of discovering the true self, right? So then people were like, oh, by the way, here's how you find it. Questions?
that ended up being way longer than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> but that's Dr. K for you. Can I recap? I just finished the recap. <laughs> we'll get to some of this stuff in the next one, though. Don't worry. Okay, can I repeat it? Sure. So we just talked about a case where someone was sort of saying, you know, when people disagree with me, like, I feel really bad. So it got to the point where when I saw someone making a comment on Twitter that disagrees with my point of view, it would throw me into a panic attack. So what I did is started blocking people on Twitter. And then I ended up blocking 30K people. And then I got off of Twitter entirely. And that helped some, but I still find myself feeling really bad when people disagree with me. So what's going on there and what do I do about it? So in summary, we have a sense of like confidence on the inside. And the more confident we are, the closer we are to our true self, the more confident we are. And the more confident we are, the more we can tolerate discordance with the outside world. The less confident we are, the more egotistical we are, and confidence and ego are on opposite ends of the spectrum, the more I need the world to get in line with like what I believe, right? So if I'm egotistical and I'm insecure about my appearance, I need everyone to compliment my appearance. And if someone says I'm ugly, I'm going to lash out at them, right? And so what ends up happening is like the reason that these disagreements like cause you personal pain is because your identity is caught up in like some of these non-identity, like non-self-related things. So if someone disagrees with you, that makes you feel like you're a bad person or incompetent in some way. And so suddenly what happens is like an external degree, uh, disagreement becomes a indictment of who you are as a person. Right? So if I, if I like Lost Ark, then I'm a bad person. But if you play League of Legends, you're a bad person, right? You see this with Dota and, and League a lot. Where Dota noobs think that look, everyone who plays LOL is noob. Everyone who plays LOL thinks that Dota people are noobs. Like, we, we make determinations about people based on their preferences. And so that all has to do with, like, our, our confidence, right? So as we start to, like, it, it, as you start to tunnel down into that, a couple of questions to ask are, you know, if I feel bad, like, what does this say about me as a person? If someone disagrees with me, well, sorry, if someone disagrees with me, what does that say about me as a person? Like, and it's kind of weird because technically it, does, it doesn't say anything, but that's not how your mind thinks, right? Your mind feels incompetent if someone disagrees with you. It's like, you're an idiot. That's what your mind is going to be telling you, and that's why you feel bad. And so how do you fix that kind of thing? Well, the first thing is to understand that, that, you know, if you are getting panic attacks and things like that, like go see a professional. Second thing is to understand that a lot of this comes from a lack of, of like healthy relationships growing up. And so healthy relationships is one way to fix it. Now, I understand that that's kind of difficult for some people because you can't fix that on your own. But the truth of the matter is that sometimes in life, like you can't fix everything on your own, right? It doesn't mean that there aren't things that you can do internally. But I've seen a lot of value or yield from having healthy relationships to repair things that unhealthy relationships have damaged, right? So if you've been in an abusive romantic relationship, being in a loving romantic relationship is a great way to fix a lot of that crap. Probably the most efficient way, to be honest. The last thing is that you can do personally introspective stuff. So today we talked about meditation, but there are all kinds of other things you can do, right? You can read about Stoic philosophy. You can go for long hikes. You can climb to the top of a mountain, those are all things that I, in a weird way, consider spiritual activities. Not to say that they're spiritual by definition, but they get a lot of the benefits that a systematic spiritual practice will get. So if you're not into spirituality, that's fine. Go and explore, right? Like, go and test yourself. Go explore the world. Go, you know, try to climb a mountain and, like, struggle to get to the top and get to the top and feel amazing about yourself. Those are all ways to build confidence. But the meditation we talked about was about the nature of self right? And to like drink tea for a moment and um, think a little bit about, you know, what is it that, who is doing the drinking, right? Like who, like, is this person a man, a woman, non-binary? Is it, you know, someone who's old, young, rich, poor? And then in that moment of experience, it's actually none, right? It's just someone drinking tea. And the more that you pay attention to your life, like on a global scale, moment to moment, you'll realize that's all you are. You're just someone drinking tea. Now I'm someone playing Lost Ark. Now I'm someone who's streaming. You know, I'm someone who has their hands up. Like, I can just feel my hands up. Like, that's what I am. That's all I am in that moment. 
right? So I'm not smart or dumb. I'm not rich or poor. I'm not good or bad. I'm not a cult leader or a messiah. You know, like I'm none of those things, right? I'm just me. So I hope that's a good summary.